I think your piano smashing analogy is a, a nice analogy. <laughs> um, it's something visual and it gets the uh, point across that you have to reduce all of these massive amounts of rocks to either dissolve solids or suspended solids yes. to push it through the uh, little holes that are in the cave. Yes. Yeah, you got that. Uh, you got it right. <laughs> and to look at the hole and say, my, what a monument to karst solution is to miss the whole damn point <laughs> that the refrigerator, the piano went through this hole. That's the point. <laughs> now you have to, to do it right, you have to sew on the other side of the hole, gluing all the pieces back together. <laughs> and you don't win until you get the piano glued back together again. <laughs> See, this is a part that Rachel missed. One of the things I would show students is that the question of how does uh, limestone get dissolved? Because if you read some books, you would think that you have to dissolve every last piece of limestone to be able to float it away. Well, I taught students that limestone is not homogeneous. It's not a block of calcium carbonate. It's a bunch of junk held together by calcium carbonate. And all you have to do is to dissolve the grain boundaries and you can float away the grains. And the grains will be dissolving all the, on their trip to the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, and maybe not even there. They may be make part of the delta. But uh, so then the question is, wouldn't you only get dissolution of limestone where there's an underground river running? So I have a place in Mammoth Cave on the speleology course when I, we climb up to the top of Bucker Breakdown or near the top and there is a ceiling that comes out of the wall and the ceiling is very wet. And I had the students scratch the ceiling and there's a paste, a limestone paste. And I say, bite into that with your teeth and move your teeth back and forth to see how gritty that is. Well, it's not very gritty, but you can tell it's gritty. And I said, how high are we above the water level? Well, we're essentially up in the Gherkin limestone, which is above the St. Genevieve, so you're probably 150 feet above the river level at least. The water never floods up to this point, but the water does come in from the bedding plain parting. Covers the ceiling and uh, apparently sits there. Well, it doesn't just sit there and become super saturated. If it did, it would be depositing crystals and things. But it's dissolving the limestone cement grains. And furthermore, this water evaporates some of the time and water condenses some of the time, so you get a dithering back and forth because of the relative humidity of the environment at that place. So you get new water, unsaturated water being deposited out of the air as condensation part of the time, and then you get evaporation of saturated water. Now, where does the paste come from? That's the residue of the undissolved limestone, uh, which is being attacked by fresh condensation all the time. So this process goes on in a in a hundred foot area uh, that we call the zone of discharge, 
as well as any other place where you've got water running all the time in a cave. Uh, that set of ideas has not been put in writing. <laughs> I've explained it to people, but nobody has investigated it. I think it's worth investigating because I think the rate of rock removal depends on development of these pastes and then the flood comes and washes it all downstream. Then you start developing more paste. So the dissolving is going on whether the water level is there or not and the occasional flood sweeps away the undissolved grains. I wonder sometimes about the uh, characterization of what's karst and what's pseudo-karst because in some cases it seems kind of gradational. Like in Laurel Caverns you essentially got almost sand that's bound together by lime cement and the lime's been dissolved away and the sand's been washed out uh, and is that a karst process because you know probably the majority of the rock's still there only the form of sand grains and it's just the cement that's been washed away and then you get the same type of surface processes like you get the granulation in, in sandstone outcrops, you know, where the the matrix holding the grains in place are dissolved and the and the sandstone falls off and that's dissolution typically of, 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 of silica. And so why is one a karst process and the other one a pseudo karst process? Well they both seem to be you know, it's doing a continuum the same thing. is is a continuum, isn't it? Yes. Sure. Well, uh, that's a good point. Because we know that uh, down in Mammoth Cave National Park, there are a whole bunch of caves in sandstone that go back 20, 30, 40 feet. <laughs> we don't call them a cave because most of them don't go back to darkness. But they're, they're caves. <laughs> So that's just one thing that's always bothered me is this it doesn't seem to be some people have this is this is karst and this isn't but it always seems to be grading from from one to the other well that's why when uh, Rachel wrote what she wrote Ergo Rubrek wrote that piece in there called bust them up and take them away because that's the process the bust them up is dissolution or erosion or both the take them away is the flowing water that carries the dissolved or undissolved pieces away and that's all there is to it now what makes it karst well it tends to be interior drainage rather than exterior drainage in other words, the, the water goes underground. Now we know that some rain comes down and becomes runoff, and other rain sinks in and becomes groundwater. Everybody knows that, or at least Geology 101 tells us that. But what happens? I mean, we know about erosion that it doesn't take very long for a bunch of rain runoff to form a gully and erode land and re remove the land without ever going very deep penetrating. But we also know that some this water sinks and becomes part of groundwater. Uh, Swinerton went on to say that you have a, a zone of percolation a zone of discharge and a zone of saturation. And he said that any cracks that may be in the zone of saturation are filled with water 
which becomes supersaturated and then dissolves and then uh, deposits crystals on the walls. And you see these in the walls of every passage in Mammoth Cave are these veins of calcite which were developed long before the whole cave was developed from this supersaturated water which was deeper underground not flowing you know if it flowed it was maybe 10 feet a year or 10 feet in 10 years whatever so yeah it's a big continuum <laughs> and you have to work out the continuum where you are in the continuum by what you see and what you don't see. I mean, both of those things are important. When I was in Washington, uh, I did not meet the various officials in the NSS, but later on, surrounding the uh, 3C expedition, I met uh, Bill Stevenson, who at that time was president of the uh, NSS. I met Bill Davies, who was the subsequent president of the NSS. And somewhere in my caving career, I met Ralph Stone, who was the first president of the NSS. The NSS was interested in prestige from the very beginning, and when they got the retired state geologist of Pennsylvania, uh, Ralph Stone, to become the president that, in Washington, D.C. That became a, another part of the uh, prestigious startup of the NSS. That uh, seems like a pretty reasonable course of action for starting up an organization, get some, somebody who's get a real name. Uh, a, a, a name in your organization, yeah. Right. So at any rate, that time I met a lot of people in the NSS and that's about when, after that expedition, uh, it, it just seemed to me a, a large waste of time because uh, there were so many people recruited who were not, as far as I was concerned, competent cavers. They couldn't survey and they mostly occupied sleeping bags and uh, were rather ineffectual in, in Crystal Cave at a time when if you're going to understand the cave you have to survey it and keep surveying it and keep going and see the maps that are produced from your surveying. Well, we didn't see the maps. Uh, and meanwhile, these, quote, drones hung around the camp eating and uh, cooking and uh, seemed to me wasting time while the few of us who weren't able to get sleeping bags did the work. <laughs> now, that was my impression at the time. I'm not sure it was accurate now as I look back on it. But nevertheless, we did realize that not a lot was accomplished on that expedition. Well, as you grow older, your perspective on things seems to change. Like, sometimes when you're young, everything seems clear-cut. And as you get older, you see some things really are pretty much black and white, but a lot of other things have a lot more nuance and, and considerations to them. And so, I wonder if you were to experience that expedition now at your age if you'd have different impressions from it than what you had when you were a young guy just getting started in it. Well of course I have many years of accumulated experience. For example at the time <coughs> Uh, Bill Austin wanted a telephone system set up that would go down to the Lost Passage. So the NSS didn't have a lot of money, but they could buy uh, an almost endless supply of uh, surplus Army telephone wire. 
So they came with several gigantic spools of this telephone wire, and somebody pointed out you'll never get down to the Lost Passage with these spools. So several people spent a lot of time rewinding smaller spools of telephone wire. And then uh, there was a, a party uh, stringing telephone lines from the commercial part of the cave down through the crawlway to uh, the lower levels of Crystal Cave and finally they got down there and uh, then the question is what do you say on the telephone? Well the telephone was used to record, tape record uh, interviews with Skeets Miller and uh, it was used to order groceries for uh, the camp for cooking. And it was used to uh, narrate reports on what people had found during the expedition. Well, shortly after the expedition, and we felt that uh, the whole telephone thing was uh, stupidly built around this surplus heavy wire that you could use a, a very lightweight wire and a friend we had recruited had been in the Navy and he said well you don't need these double E8 uh, crank up telephones with a big dry battery in them but let's, let's use sound powered uh, telephone components which are surplus from the Navy. So we ended up perfecting the telephone system and, and running some additional very lightweight wire. We found we could run the wire as fast as a party could go out B-Trail. And then hook on just one side of a uh, pair of headphones and uh, talk very well with another party up on the surface. And it quickly dawned on us that we had by that time figured out the idea that uh, caving parties ought to carry their own food, ought to go in and hit the cave, do the survey, and then get out, and then rest up, not depend on underground camps. Well, nevertheless, we had a telephone wire that went all the way out to Camp Pitt. And the conversations on that telephone were, uh, hey, hey, it's good to hear from you. What's, it, what's going on up there? Oh, it's starting to rain? That's very interesting. It's not raining down here. Ha, ha, ha. And uh, pretty soon we realized that we had nothing to talk about on the telephone system. And while it might be appropriate for a long-term expedition, by that time, we concluded that, you, that camping in a cave was not efficient. Uh, people tended to stick around camp rather than go survey the cave. Uh, <clears throat> so we finally just abandoned the telephone system. So that's the kind of experience you gain after a while. And that fits in with uh, Werner Ron Braun's statement that they put the lifeboats on the uh, ship. <laughs> and, and while many years ago they had the lifeboat station on the shore, they, it's better to have the lifeboats, lifeboats on the ship. So at that point we began to see that the party leader was, uh, and the party leader's skills were uh, critical for safety and for making sure people got to the place where they could survey and get back from it. Uh, we shared uh, much of this uh, information about the improved telephone system, but at the same time we shared the fact that uh, if you had more or less independent uh, self-sufficient cave party so you didn't need to communicate back and forth through the expedition headquarters. So 
And we also discovered uh, during that expedition that a lot of people who claimed to own a lot of pitons and rope and so on didn't know anything about caving. <laughs> and furthermore, they seemed to uh, have a penchant to uh, avoid uh, serious work to understand the cave. So at that point, we began to suspect that we were not going to be able to just recruit cavers and attack the Crystal Cave uh, but, and Flint Ridge Cave System. We had to have people who uh, didn't know that you could sleep in a sleeping bag in a cave and uh, eat oatmeal and Spanish rice in a cave. And <laughs> so we, I went to the Air Force laboratory, which was across the street from our motion picture unit, and told them about what we had learned. And he said, well, we have uh, airplanes that fly long distances, and we have some of the food that they use on those long flights. And, Here's a whole box full of that stuff. Well, that stuff included canned bone chicken and a date nut roll and a, a few very efficient foods for long distance nourishment. And uh, so after we used up that box of food, we uh, found that we could buy canned bone chicken at the grocery store. and. Uh, date nut loaf at the grocery store and pretty soon we had everything we needed for cave trips of 18 to 24 hours or more. So the party would go in and eat a couple of meals and uh, do uh, a bunch of surveying and then come out of the cave. Now they were very tired after these long trips but those were quite efficient compared to what went on during the C-3 expedition. So once again, uh, your characterization of the uh, value of a long experience is entirely accurate. I think that's accurate in mountain climbing and almost every other uh, undertaking that people associate with uh, risk and adventure. Let's jump ahead and talk about your work at Wright State University. How did you get involved with Wright? During uh, my advertising career, uh, I worked for a client in Springfield called Robbins and Myers. And Robbins and Myers had hired a marketing professor from Wright State by the name of Herb Brown. And Herb Brown was looking into their future markets. And uh, I got to meet him and talk with him several times. And he suddenly realized that there was a branch of advertising that was not well known to marketers called industrial advertising. Almost all the information most people knew about advertising were New York advertising agencies where people did a lot of drinking and a lot of talking about how to sell cigarettes and uh, toothpaste. And, uh, but industrial advertising at that time was fairly specialized niche of, uh, of advertising. So we had a number of discussions and one day he said to me, would you uh, be interested in talking to my class? I'm teaching a class in industrial marketing. And I said, oh, I'd love to. So I gave a lecture on the subject of the buyer problem in marketing. And it was my observation that a good bit of marketing deals with the seller's problem. That is, I've got a warehouse full of stuff. I've got to figure out how to move it to uh, people who uh, will buy it. And that was the basis for a lot of advertising was uh,
try to create some demand for whatever. But my focus was on the buyer's problem, and so I gave a lecture based on my understanding of that whole thing. Well, about six months later, I got a call from Herb Brown, and he said, uh, I've got some bad news. And I said, what's that? He said, I've written, a, I, I recorded your talk to my class. And I said, well, that's, that's not bad news. I, uh, I don't have any secrets there. And he said, well, uh, I wrote a paper based on it, and the paper's been accepted. <laughs> and uh, he said, it's, I, I have engaged in plagiarism. And I said, oh, you are in a tough spot. I said, well, uh, how would it be if you included me as a joint author? And he said, would you do that? And I said, yeah. <laughs> So he did, and this was a landmark paper in, in industrial marketing, was the whole basis of that marketing being different from consumer marketing, in that you had to understand if you're going to sell a milling machine, who needs a milling machine? You cannot advertise it widely because only a few people need a milling machine. And they're spending somebody else's money on, for it. So the marketing is different. You have to find out who needs that machine before you engage in serious marketing. And uh, when, when you do, you need to find out about this person's need. Do they really need your milling machine or do they need some other milling machine? Uh, at any rate, it, well, not long after that, uh, <clears throat> uh, Brown became head of the marketing department at Wright State, and he immediately uh, sought to hire me. Now, there was a problem there because I had never had a marketing course. I majored in fine art at Oberlin, drawing and painting, although I was doing marketing communications and had been for a couple of years by that time. So I said, sure, uh, and I thought, well, he's going to ask me to teach an advertising course, and I'd be glad to do that. I'm, I'm sure I can handle all parts of advertising. He said, no, I want you to teach an industrial marketing course. So I said, uh, yeah, I can do that too. So that was the beginning of teaching as an adjunct professor. And uh, after teaching several industrial marketing courses, he asked if I would teach an advertising course. And uh, then he asked if I would teach a course in strategic marketing for graduate students. And I did that. and. Uh, then I taught a course in personal selling, and by this time, of course, I was established as an adjunct professor. And I moved around teaching various courses, including one in the summertime called Marketing in Society, talking about the interaction between marketing and uh, uh, generalized uh, social behavior. Uh, all of these required working up the course, which I quickly did, but, and it was, uh, I enjoyed teaching a lot, I always have, uh, because uh, as you teach, you discover that there are a few things that are essential for students to understand and learn and be able to practice if they're going to be competent in either speleology or marketing, which 